This week on CrossFeed, Moses versus Jesus. Is the Bible just too liberal? Sex offenders, unclean, unclean. Praise the Lord and pass the ammo. And women pastors get cut off. Welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I am Pastor Dale Critchley, Pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. Hey, I'm Pastor Jim Butler at St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts, freshly back from vacation. Yep. You notice? Um, Jim's back. Really thankful to have uh, Joe Burnham on last week. Um, happy to have Jim back after vacation. <laughs> so, have a good vacation, Jim. It was wonderful. Wonderful. Missouri's good, Kansas was good, Lake the Ozarks was great, and Colorado was as awesome as ever. Yep. And you're sensibly going in the fall and you know, Missouri's not really a place to visit in the summertime. <laughs> That's true. Uh but uh but Colorado we we were in Colorado Springs and uh, actually we're getting an ice storm. Um didn't know if we were going to go in the mountains cuz we were worried cuz they've already got snow up there. But um, actually, it was 70 degrees up in the mountains, so uh, and sunny, so that was gorgeous up there. So we enjoyed it. Um, but uh, then we came back here, and we're getting snow here in uh, Boston today. There you go. <laughs> and I don't know if we have anybody from Tennessee that's watching, but apparently your team did not like the snow. Fifty nine to nothing. I hope you people can just, you know, even get out of bed tomorrow. I just, you know, I can't laugh too hard. My Wisconsin teams haven't been doing all that great. In fact, they they lost to Iowa, which is always a little painful, you know, for me. So, yes, I understand. So, uh, where should we start tonight? I oh, I want to start with this conservative Bible. Okay. I, I, I just. All right. This, this really uh, kind of floored me, just because, you know, usually it's the liberals that are that want to rewrite the Bible, and you know, you got your uh, inclusive language kind of stuff. Um, you know, God the Mother, and you know, and all that kind of thing, um, or just can't refer to God by masculine pronouns and, and that. Well, now, um, some of you may be familiar with a website called Conservapedia. All right, Conservapedia was writ was created as a response to Wikipedia because they said Wikipedia is too liberal. All right, even though the whole point of Wikipedia is that anybody, regardless of your direction, can contribute to it. Now they try to keep it. Uh, you know, if, if people start really hacking um, particular. Uh, Entries, you know, to to kind of skew things one direction or the other, they'll try to just sort of even it out and then lock it uh, to prevent people from messing with it. You know, they've got one thing I think that people don't understand because I'm a fan of Wikipedia. Um, I don't think it's always 100% reliable, but then again, um, there have been studies done that have found that it has about the same percentage of errors as uh, like Encyclopedia Britannica or one of the officially recognized encyclopedias, they're not perfect either. Um, so um, I think the thing that a lot of people don't understand is that there are hundreds or thousands of editors um, that volunteer their time with Wikipedia that every time somebody makes uh, an edit, they get notified. Somebody gets notified to check it. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so it, that's, you know, what keeps it reliable and what, and what keeps it from just becoming, a, you know, infestation of spam and everything else. Um, At so, least somewhat reliable. There, yeah. A few errors have crept through and some major ones. Right, right. Uh, as everybody heard on the news last week about Rush Limbaugh. But that's another side point of these side points. Speaking of conservatives. Um, yes. Um, so this group <laughs> created Conservapedia and... Um, I mean, if you go check it out, it's it's really uh, these are the the um, sort of conservative conservatives. Um, yes. And uh, now they want to um, 
uh, rid the the Bible of liberal bias uh, and uh, have a Bible of a modern conservative perspective. Now, um, one thing, by the way, I just that really irritates me about this article. And they use the term Christ twice is to rewrite the Bible, um, and it's not rewriting; it's questions of translation. That's that's what it comes down to, and um, so um, you know some some things that they say is uh, uh, no unisex language. Uh, they're going to use masculine pronouns. Uh, you don't dumb down the reading level. This is right off their their web page, Conservative Bible Project. Um, uh, con far, uh, combat harmful addiction. Uh, you know, don't say cast lots. Say they gambled. Uh, though actually it's not really gambling. It's, you know, a lot of times they, a lot of times they, they draw straws or whatever it is they did when they cast these lots to find out stuff what God had to say or looking right. for, it's really divination. Yeah. What they're looking for. Uh, accept the logic of hell. Um, exclude later inserted inauthentic passages. Well, I got news for you guys. Everybody does that. Although now what the article that you linked to, that, that we linked to, Particularly points out, um, the, for example, Jesus' word on the cross, uh, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, uh, which they say is often, the liberals like that one a lot. And the liberals like Jesus and the woman caught in adultery with, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, I, you know, whoever has no sin, let them cast the first stone. I think we had a bad influence on her. The, the, the woman caught in adultery most definitely not part of originally part of Sean. That's that we're pretty sure of. The other passage, though, the Luke passage, that's much more questionable. Mm-hmm. Although I'm sure, guys, if you're listening, you will be very happy to know that I know at least one very liberal professor that doesn't think it should be there either. So just to know you do agree with him, okay? Just just to <laughs> let you know. All right, I, I think it's important to explain this because people are, you know, probably going to tar us as. Um as, uh, you know, these kind of people that like to pick and choose out of the Bible. Anybody that's been watching the show for any period of time at all know that that is not the case. What we're talking about is there are these sort of minor variations as you go through the ancient manuscripts. And there's some of the manuscripts are on papyrus. Those are the oldest ones um, where there's just fragments, you know, where they found this piece of, mm-hmm. of old papyrus that, just a little bit of it has been preserved, and sometimes it's just a few words, you know, because um, papyrus doesn't hold up for thousands of years usually, okay? And it's it's just kind of a miracle that the parts that did, um, not miracle as in, who, you know, it's proof that God exists or something, but, you know, really it, it doesn't hold up very well, and, and so it was just kind of... Um, Impressive. Then, then you've got the stuff that's written on... Um, on uh, uh, what's it called? Like parchment. It's um, mm-hmm. like a, almost like leather, almost. And um, that's a little sturdier. It's also a little newer, um, and so it holds up better. And so we've got a lot more of that. And uh, now the Old Testament, we've got you know the Dead Sea Scrolls been discovered. We have almost the entire Old Testament. Uh, except for Esther. Esther doesn't appear in the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, interestingly. Um, but that's a, a side tangent. Um, but now, within all of these manuscripts, there's variations. They're very minor variations. All right? The biggest ones are, for instance, the story of the woman caught in adultery and the, the he who has no sin cast the first stone. All right? That's not in a lot of the early manuscripts. It's just not there. And um, and it shows up. Some manuscripts is at the end of John. Yeah, and um, and then you've got uh, the whole Mark sixteen. That whole chapter is missing from a lot of manuscripts. <clears throat> well, actually, after verse eight. Insufferable know it all. So, That's but the then whole chapter. The resurrection right. is taught in Mark. Well, all, right, all right, right. Mark, <laughs> the resurrection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, but it, it sort of ends like. What's going on? You know, Jesus is risen, and it's just, it kind of leaves it, which, you know, really, 
the rest of that was probably added in later um, because Mark's whole point, if you look at the point of the book, is even the people that were there didn't get it. You know, he's pointing out it's true, but don't think that it would have been easier for you because he was writing this to the persecuted Christians in Rome. You know, don't think that it would have been easier for you if you'd been there because even the people there didn't get it. And so you, we have even at the end, they still don't get it. They're still Jesus is risen and they're just kind of going, what's going on? You know, but that was the point is. And so so there are these little things. Other places, it's like, uh, you know, they used a different word for and, you know, or, or, or something like that. Um, or it's a, a, a translation issue. Um, or like there's this, the disciples say, Jesus, are you going to this party? And in one manuscript, he says, no, I'm not going. In another one, he says, no, I'm not going yet. Well, he shows up at the party later on. And so probably some scribe who is copying it said, um, hmm, that looks like a contradiction. I'll change it, you know, to, to make it agree. All right. These variations are very minor. You know, there's a couple of these big ones. But for the most part, it's more like this sort of used a different word for and um, kind of thing. And and so none of the variations are the kind of things that all of a sudden are going to change your doctrine. You know, there's just, there may be a, a, a little piece missing here. Um, a little sort of, they where, where a scribe sort of went, um, you know, kind of fleshed something out. Or for instance, the, the end of the Lord's Prayer, for thine is the kingdom and the power, that part. Um, one of the, which I always forget because depending which trend, some translations, you'll actually find that at the end of both of them. And some oh, of them, only in King James that you find them at all. It's actually from Chronicles that that was an early liturgical edition. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, different, d- d- you watch your translations and different ones will have it in, in different, um, some will have it in Matthew, some will have it in Luke and, you know, and stuff like that. Um, so, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't change anything, but that it was a liturgical thing that people are so used to it that the scribe that was copying it probably was just going from memory and, you know, <laughs> copied it out. Well, he uh, didn't, didn't look right. Didn't sound right. Got to right. put it in. Um, now there's other little things. Sometimes it's the wrong homophone, uh, you know, red or red color versus read the book. Sometimes it's uh, misspelling. Sometimes it's obvious that the guy beforehand couldn't quite figure out what the guy there was writing and tried to figure it out. And so, but so that's one issue with them. Another issue is uh, how do you um, translate? So um, uh, Luke 16 has the uh, parable of the often called the dishonest manager. Um, it says he's commended because he act yeah you know, he, he's dishonest because he acted shrewdly. And they said, well, that has con- negative connotations. It's really not shrewdly. It should be translated resourcefully. You know, um, actually, Jesus called the guy dishonest. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> but, but, you know, they, they, you know, so uh, another thing is they, you know, they said there's these social words, socialistic words in there. Our comrade. I'm not even sure where that word's even in the, the Bible. I'd have to even look that up. But, you know, uh, the, um, and employee and laborer and laborers and it should be volunteers in places and so there's definitely some you know they they this that's some of these are legitimate issues i mean how do you translate things in from one language to another mm-hmm. yeah um i mean so even some of their ideas are, isn't really so bad uh one of the, the their their translation of john instead of saying the word beginning with the word the word is with god um they argue the translation there, um, they argue for that the word, um, the truth was with God. Uh, and another place they, you know, uh, they, they translate the, the word true as li- the living truth. Uh, and there is two, there are two different ru- words in John for truth. One is what is, tr- one is kind of genuineness and the other one is true versus false. And so, so there are sometimes, um, some legitimate issues of how, you know, how do you bring it from Greek or Hebrew and that mindset into English and that we can understand it. But, um, I don't know. I, I, I worry whenever you get, you know, some people who say we need to have a particular 
viewpoint behind it. Right, right. Because then what you're doing is you're taking, all right, this is my viewpoint, and I'm going to insert it into the Bible, and I'm going to make the Bible say what I want it to see. That's what the Jehovah's Witnesses did. Same thing. They they translate it based on their theology, not the other way around. They don't, instead of drawing their theology from the original text. And so they, you know, for instance, with they, we talk about John 1, all right, Jehovah's Witnesses translate it, and it's, uh, if anybody wants to check it out, it's the New Kingdom Translation is what it's called. Um, they say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. All right, because they say, look, there's no definite, or there's no uh, definite ar- article there, and so therefore, um, it's it's indefinite. Which most times in Greek, it's the case, except when in the cases of proper nouns. Proper nouns do not require an article, um, or a definite article, and so therefore, uh, it really should be, unless there's an indication otherwise, it should be taken as a uh, um, as a proper noun there, and and therefore, just simply God, um, in in English capital letter. The other thing is, uh, <laughs> this is on their, their their web page, and I you know this is an interesting. Says, the committee in charge of updating the best selling version, the NIV, is dominated by professors and higher educated participants who can be expected to be liberal and feminist in outlook. As a result, the revision replaced the NIV will be influenced more by political correctness and other liberal distortions rather by, than by a genuine examination of the oldest manuscripts. Um, I mean, talk about a bias. I mean, the people who, you know, who are going to work on it are people, you know, we, we covered this story a few weeks ago. Um, you know, people who are evangelical scholars who have, you know, affirmed the inerrancy of scripture. Um, yeah. Now again, I mean, how do you define things? I mean, um, <clears throat> I mean, the, the word "man." I mean, you know, uh, um, does that, you know, or brothers? Uh, you know, the, the term "brothers" in the New Testament means fellow Christians. That's mm-hmm. what he's talking to. He's talking to men and women. Is there what's wrong about saying "brothers and sisters"? Right. That's that's understood. But that would be understood by the people who heard it. Right. may not be understood by us. It's, you know, it's the same as in English where you say, uh, whoever comes, I'll help him out. All right. That doesn't mean um, I'm only going to help men. It's just um, it's using a singular instead of saying him or her. You know, well, Greek and Hebrew both have that use that same concept of sort of if there's, um, you know, a thousand women and one man, you use the masculine pronoun. And right. um and, and it's just that's just the way the language is, so you can't but, just automatically again. Assume. That's trying to how do you bring it into modern English? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's it's you know, and and but I know that. So do we get those? Those that there are those issues that do come up. Now, some of them legitimately, some of them illegitimately. Uh, if you look at the evangelical Lutheran uh, evangelical Lutheran worship, the new um, ELCA hymnal. And they replaced all the masculine terms for God, uh, you know, so that God thinks on God's self. Um, what a weird term. Uh, or the Psalms in it, um, they take out he and they turn it to you. So instead of uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. It's you make me lie down in green pastures. You lead me beside the still waters. Yeah, and that's not what God said. <laughs> no, that's not a that's not legitimate at all to, to to do that. There, I think there's a definite bias. So, anyway, that's it's an interesting thing. Read the th- read it. Uh, look up the link. Look up some. They even have some of the uh, works already that they've started translating. Um, have fun with it. And see what you think. By the way, you and I would be highly educated. I have a doctorate, so I guess I'm a pointy head liberal too, as far as they're concerned. Yep, yep, just flaming, <laughs> flaming, obviously flaming. <laughs> okay, so um, well, let's go on back then to here. Here's the question: A lot of the dealing with 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 America and conservatives and liberals and Bible. So, who is America's role model? 
Jesus or Moses? Ten! Ten commandments! So we've got an article. This is on Fox News. All right. So conservative. Um, and uh, it's from uh, Bruce Feiler. And he said, uh, four years ago, I set out to examine the role of Moses in American life. By the time I was done, I made a startling discovery. Moses has been more important to American history than Jesus. And um, so he starts out with history, and he talks about um, how when the Continental Congress asked Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin, and John Adams to design a seal for the new United States, they made the recommendation, Moses leading the Israelites across the Red Sea. Um, and then there's all these different um, people, uh, George Washington, Harriet Tubman, um, you know, just all these people throughout American history who have been compared with Moses. But how many have actually been compared with Jesus? Not very many. Or, yeah, the pilgrims compared their story to Moses. Uh, on the Liberty Bell, there's a quote from Moses. Uh, the Underground Railroad, there was the... Um, uh, what is it? Uh, the the um, go down Moses, go down Moses. Spiritual uh, song. Let my yep. people go. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's that old spiritual song, "Go Down Moses." Um, so there were. Well, and, and I I would agree, but I disagree as to why he thinks so. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's two things. Oh, by the way, before before I get to that point. One, two, three, four, fifth paragraph down. Of course, Jesus was influential in American life. The United States at its founding was 100% Christian and it's 75% Christian. I think that's probably a real shock to the Quakers in Pennsylvania and to, um, you know, to William Penn. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's probably a real, and to Benjamin Franklin and to Thomas Jefferson the deist. I think they'd be real shocked to know that. <laughs> yeah. I would. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was not 100% Christian. Anybody that tells you, maybe the guys that go over the Conservapedia site would probably tell you that it was 100% <laughs> Christian. But I assure you that all you got to do is go and uh, take a look at Thomas Jefferson's Bible. He liked the Bible, <laughs> but he was not a Christian. Yeah, I think there are a few Jews running around too, the country too, all right. So <laughs> they might be a little surprised by this too. I, I, but I anyway, think, yeah, seventy-five um, percent today. I don't yeah, think so. I think that should be generous. But I, I it, he he says he thought it. Um, he had some reason down here why he thought that Moses was more important. But I think it's um, very much simpler. Uh, uh, much simpler. Oh, he says. Moses represents the courage to leave oppression and create a better world. He embodies the American jungly act between freedom and law. He encapsulates the desire to build a society that uplifts the tra- downtrodden and nurtures the outsider. Um, I think it's a little bit different. I think it's just that most, everybody can relate to Moses because it's law. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, Jesus is the more the unique gospel and, um, you know, and Jesus is, uh, uh, by nature, more exclusive. Right. Because you yeah. either accept or you don't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Moses, you know, Ten Commandments. Um, first few, you know, people might uh, struggle with, but even the atheists are going to agree with the, the rest of them. You know? Oh, let's see. Honor those in authority? Eh, question authority, but, you know, but honor them. Um as long as they're doing their job and, um, especially know, if which, parents. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think atheists say to your kids, go ahead, disrespect me, kid. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, yeah, no kidding. Uh, you know, you don't know. kill, don't commit adultery for the most part. You know, nowadays it's a little, uh, fast and loose, but most people still, uh, agree with that, but they have their own definition of it. Um, the, you know, don't kill people, be happy with what you have and, and, Instead of wanting somebody else's stuff, you know, I mean, this is just the natural law. This is stuff that everybody agrees with. And so Moses comes along saying this kind of stuff and, okay, hey, yeah, cool. You know, I, you had, you said you had another reason. Go ahead with it. Oh, no, that was it. That was basically oh, okay. it. Was, uh, I see uh, another reason. Um, you know, he talks about, uh, George Washington was called America's Moses, um, for leading a beleaguered band of colonists against the superpower of the day. When he died, two-thirds of the eulogies compared the first conductor 
of the Jewish nation to the leader and father of the American nation. And I thought about this. You know, Jesus leads us to heaven. Uh, but so there's, I mean, there's obviously this huge parallel. But here's a question. Would people refer on a regular basis, refer to, to people who sort of lead people out of oppression and that, would they say, that's my Jesus? And I would say no, because that comes across as being a bit um, a bit irreverent. You know, when you recognize Jesus isn't just a guy. Yeah, you know, I was uh, I was doing uh, my children's message this morning, and I was talking about Jesus being the only way to heaven, and I said, uh, you know, how many doors are there to get into heaven? And um, and and kids are, I don't know, you know, and uh, they were sort of throwing random numbers at me and stuff. And, um, and so I said, uh, you know, there's just one and, and Jesus is the door to heaven. And, uh, I said, is, you know, but is, is Jesus a door? And they said, no, he's, he, no, he's, he's not a door. And I said, yeah, he's just a guy, right? Yeah. And then, and then my daughter goes, yeah, but he, I mean, he's not just a guy. <laughs> you know, he's God. <laughs> I said, well, that's right. And, uh, so, so yeah, I mean, Jesus, he, he's he's God. <laughs> so, are you going to compare people to him? Not as much, because it kind of it, it it belittles Jesus a bit. You know, I I would feel very uncomfortable with people referring. You know, I got little kids come up to me, "Hi, Jesus," you know, and he's like, "No, no, no, no," <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? You know, King Herod was was worshipped as God. He was eaten by worms. All right, I we're not going to go down that path, you know. <laughs> or as I once told a kid, "Thanks for the promotion, but no, not quite." Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no. So um, yeah, but and I, I yeah, I, I think I agree with that. It's, you know that uh, um, I mean, the best you can say is that Jesus is some sort of great example, which um, you know, broadly speaking, which C.S. Lewis so beautifully you know destroys. Uh, in his, uh, you know, saying, look, you know, say Jesus, look what Jesus said and what he claimed about himself. It's on par saying, you know, I'm a poached egg. Um, you know, it's he either was was crazy or he's God's son. He's anything but a good example. So I've um, heard, I, I, think, I saw an atheist pick that one apart, though, um, that said, you know, all, all kinds of people have claimed all kinds of things about themselves. And we still recognize their, um, you know, things that the, the positive things that they've said, but that's a, a side issue. Um, and uh, he was still either he was son of God or he was a nut job. So um, I prefer the former. But um, it, I, I thought that was interesting. Some of the things I did not know that uh, the Statue of Liberty's head and tablet um, are come from the mo the moment when Moses comes down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments and you know his face glowing and stuff like that. I was not aware of that. Um, it doesn't surprise me, given that the poem at the base of the Statue of Liberty was written by a Jew. Um, there's you know connection there. I don't know if that's coincidence or not. Um, but um, and we can't let the story go without mentioning the Superman reference. Um, we've oh, yes. A few times on this show, actually, about um, about uh, Superman as a Christ figure. Um, but interestingly enough, he he ties the comparison with um, he says Superman's backstory comes from the superhero of the Torah. Both figures were born to a people facing annihilation, floated to safety in a small vessel, then picked up and raised by strangers before being summoned to save humanity. Even Superman's original name, Kal-El, is Hebrew for Swift God. Now, I knew the L was God. Um, I, it didn't click the, the Cal being um, Swift, but, you know, he's, he's right there. So, yeah. Um, yes, uh, well, and, um, yeah, there, there's often questions uh, uh, about uh, uh, Superman being a Christ figure. I uh, never heard him as a Moses figure, but yeah, you can see that that symbolism definitely the way he mentions it and brings it up. Uh, well, given that his creators, uh, Joe Schuster and who's the other one? Might you know this? Jerry Siegel. There you go. Um, 
they were Jews. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's the Moses uh, parallel there. That's probably not a coincidence. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and 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 the <laughs> this, is, this is great. Um, you know, I, I hadn't actually I hadn't heard about this. Um, um, but uh, but uh, the Ten Commandments. commandments uh, uh, so so speak the real appear on screen, screen to tell to tell the viewers the movement was called versus communism. communism. At the end of the, the end of the film, Charlton Heston the world's most disowns his own ability to help and mimics the mimics of the Statue of Liberty. It's not it's a not word of that. that. Never heard of it either. So, so, yeah. you know, the other yeah, thing, the other thing is he went out to, to look, look for the references, references to, Moses to Moses in American, American culture. culture. Okay. okay. So it's so no it's big no surprise that he found what he was looking for. for. You know, he wasn't he looking to see how many references to Jesus there were in American culture. And, and I'm thinking that the reason he didn't is because they're so blatant in everywhere. Well, why don't you use your divine influence? That could be. That could there goes be. our audio. Oh, you've been messing up for some time. So, um, well, let's do a couple updates here. Okay. Um, we, um, uh, one of them was a story that we we talked about tonight. But the other one is now we talked about this young girl who um, was Muslim, converted to Christianity, had run away to Florida, um, and for a while there, the court has ruled that she is to go back to Ohio mm-hmm. and back to her family. So um, I'm not sure all the ramifications of that, but that has finally gone through the court, and that has been the ruling. The other one is one of the stories we're going to do tonight about this uh, pastor in Kentucky who promoted um, a gun celebration day. Yep. Uh, Ken uh, Pagano, that had the open carry celebration at New Bethel Church in South Louisville, and uh, he... <laughs> he he got out of the ministry. Um, he wasn't kicked out. It's not that his church said, "Dude, you're off the wall. You're out of here." Um, he uh, is now working part time at a local gun range and helped form the International Security Coalition of Clergy, along with a New York rabbi. So they're promoting the use of armed and trained security at houses of worship. Yeah. Uh, he said he felt like a liability, said he felt like it brought too much attention to the church, and he was burned out with the ministry anyway. So, <laughs> I'm not sure I want some guy who's burned out with the ministry to be carrying it. Carrying, I don't hey, know. He went out with a bang. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Ooh, okay. <laughs> but you know, it's a good thing no sex offender tried to come by his church. <laughs> Might have shot him on side. <laughs> you Homo sapiens and your oh, that's guns. Good okay. Yeah, that's a good transition. That that that's magic. That one was. Uh, this is so. I, this I is now. This is an is interesting issue. Um, I think we dealt with the actually this with a, in a Lutheran church a long time ago. I can't remember, but um, we actually dealt with a story or not then. But okay, people are convicted of sex offenses, and they often have a lot of restrictions. And churches have, like yours and mine, have preschools or daycare centers. Mm-hmm. And they all have, most of them have Sunday schools for the kids yep. there. And nurseries and, during worship, some do. Ours does. Yep. And um, so in several areas, sex offenders who may have been going to chapel or whatever in, uh, uh, in, in jail uh, have been forbidden from going to church. Because there are children there. Yeah. They're not allowed within certain distance of a, um, of a daycare um, or uh, where an area, uh, I had it marked, where basically an area that's specifically set aside for the use of, um, for the teaching or of children. Right. Um, and um, one, this one guy, he's 31 years old. He uh, was convicted twice of uh, in taking indecent liberties with a teen teen girl, and again in 2003 for second-degree rape. And he says, the law gives you no room to better yourself. His name's Nichols. Uh, uh, um, what's it? James Nichols. You know what, James? If you're watching this, you know what you need to do? You need to go out and make an Oscar-winning movie. 
<laughs> Obscure joke. Talk to your parents. Yeah. Yeah. That, and leave the country before you're convicted. Or at least before you're sentenced. You and go. they'll all walk you back with open arms. <laughs> yeah. We're in trouble. <laughs> hmm. Okay, that option aside. <laughs> <laughs> So this is this is Here, really significant, all right? What do you, what do, you do, Jim? Issue. I think this is a really hard issue. Um, how do you um, protect kids on the one hand? And a lot of sex offenders are repeat offenders. Um, at the same time, really understand this idea of grace. Right. That God can turn a life around and we are different people. Um, as a parent, I'm probably going to side with, okay, we understand the grace issue, but we've got to protect the kids. Right. Okay. But the thing is, there are things you can do to protect the kids without actually locking the doors, you know, to certain people. All right. And this guy says right in the article, it's at the end of the article, he says, um, and here, let me get the exact quote. Uh, he says, God turned my life around. Oh, this is somebody different, uh, Sean Cox. And um, he says, God turned my life around. I'm not saying that you bring the guy in and put him over the youth program or the youth ministry as soon as he walks in the door. But there's no way he can overcome these things without help and support. All right? You know, and, and that's the thing. We've got anybody in our church that works with youth has to have a thorough background check. I mean, when I got here, they handed me the information and said, here, you go to this place, you, they do an FBI background check, and, and, you know, there's two different things. You pay like 80 bucks and you um, you get fingerprinted and, and they look at your ID and everything. They do a thorough background check on you. Um, and you can't be alone with kids until you clear. Yep. So, By the way, the, you folks out there in conservapedia trying to come up with a conservative Bible, um, the people who are denying him uh, the right to go to church – it was a law put through by a Democrat. Okay, just so you guys, you know, you can, you know, throw that into your Bible now too. Yeah, so that is. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you, just just a little little interesting thing there for those folks. Uh, a little red meat for the conservapedia people out there. But okay, no, you don't. Put, you're, you're, you don't put them in youth group in the day they come. You're never going to put them in charge of a youth thing. You're never going to let them really be around kids. Um, there's got to be an understanding that, okay, uh, now there's this Lutheran church, and I can't remember where it was. I want to say it was in Denver, and it was an ELCA congregation. And, uh, they had the same situation. The guy who was a sex offender wanted to become, again, wanted to come to worship. And so he had to come to their early service, because that was when they had the fewest kids. And that was one agreement he had to make. Um, the other agreement he had to make was that he would have to be accompanied at all times in the building. So one of the other men in the congregation always had to walk with him, uh, particularly uh, in going using the bathroom. Uh, they would have to walk into to, to the restroom with him, uh, but he was never permitted to walk by himself anywhere in the building. Yep. And I thought those two. Those are reasonable restrictions. Yeah, I mean, you know, at our church, um, when the when the preschool is is in is running, um, no one's no adults are allowed in the bathroom. Period. You know, for me, my office is in my garage. Um, it's it, it sounds bad, but it's not. It's it's real nice. It's got air conditioning, heat, and everything. But um, so that means that when the preschool is going, if I got to go to the bathroom, I go home. Not over to church. <laughs> if I'm over at church doing something, I go home. <laughs> if I got to go to the bathroom, it's just reality, you know. Right. Um, um. So, yeah, I, I think that as long as you can come up with with ways that are sort of mutually agreeable, um, that there's no reason that they shouldn't be able mm -hmm. to be there, you know, and and come to to a Bible study where they it's it's all adults there. Um, and it's in a group mm -hmm. setting, you know, normally in a group setting, 
unless the person has a specific, um, you know, conviction where something happened in a group setting, usually this stuff happens. Um, uh, and I don't know, maybe somebody will correct me on this. Um, but I, cause I'm operating by assumption, not statistics or anything. Um, but I'm assuming that usually this stuff happens when you get alone with somebody. Um, and so it generally doesn't happen out in public. No, right, uh, right. you know, uh, I, I, and you know, the, but the kids do have to be protected. I know of at least two situations. One up here, well, I know there's three situations, um, all in Lutheran churches, where one of one of which New England, um, where um, either the pastor in one case, um, actually it was a classmate of mine from college, um, or um, in another case, one was the Sunday. The other two cases, they, they, the person was the Sunday school director in the congregation. Um, all male had molested children in the con- in from the church. I mean, that's sad, but it's true. And so, no, you can't take the risk. Doesn't mean we keep them outside. Doesn't mean they're lepers. Doesn't mean you know we we you know bar the door, Johnny. But you take you know here you know something, so you have to take the precautions. Right. You know because I mean if some kid, God forbid, some kid is is, is you know, uh, molested in a congregation. Um, to ruin his life with God forever. Right. His or her life with God forever. Yeah, because every time they're going to be afraid to go to church, any time you talk about going to church, it's going to, all the stuff's going to resurface. They're not going to want to go to church. And, you know. And the, and the devastation to the congregation. Mm-hmm. That, that would be unimaginable. Right. Yeah. But, I mean, at the same time, we've got to do everything we can to reach out with, I mean, because talk about people that, that really need to hear forgiveness, mm-hmm. you know? I mean, these really are the lepers of our society, or the maybe the tax collectors, or, you know, whatever uh, metaphor you want to use. Um, but, you know, these are people that, that the whole, probably tax collectors are pretty good, um, you know, comparison. Mm-hmm. No. I'm going to tell you right now, I, I'm, I'm, I go to the jail. And, um, there's, um, and they, the sex offenders are in, um, what, what's called administrative segregation. Basically, it's protective custody. They're in their own little area. It's highly restricted. But they're all in there for their own protection and safety. Because if they were in the regular jail, everybody else would kill them. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just it. They they are they are considered to be the absolute scum of the jail. At the same time, like I said, I go in there, uh, have and oftentimes we'll have mm, three, four, five of the guys, um, you know, sitting around this table and uh, um, you know discussing, you know, and really needing to hear that word of grace and forgiveness. Mm-hmm. But no, even tax collectors one of those these guys are. Okay. Fair enough. I mean, yeah. Put, put it like this: at least the other sinners like them. <laughs> the other sinners consider these people too low to deal anything with. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, Fair you enough. know, so so it's um. Yeah. Uh, well, let's move over to the Church of England here. End up for the night. Uh, Once again, talking about schism in the Church of England. <laughs> yes. Does anything else ever happen in the Church of England? It seems like every time we talk about them or the Episcopalians or anything, <laughs> it's, it's schism. <laughs> and, well, this time, though, it's not dealing over gays. This time is the issue of just women's ordination. It's particularly bishop. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, um, in, obviously, the Episcopal Church of the United States of America, they have, they have a presiding bishop. Uh, but within the Church of England, uh, actually in England, uh, there uh, I, are currently no women bishops ordained. And the rule is, by the way, you have to have three other bishops to ordain a bishop. So that's, that's uh, they work that whole apostolic succession thing. And uh, there is no, not, will not be an ordination of a woman uh, unlikely before 2014. So it's still about five years off, if it ever does happen. It's at least five years off. But basically, they've made an agreement that um, if a church says, we do not accept the ordination of women, then a male bishop will go into that church to do confirmations, ordaining of priests, 
and not a female bishop. We don't serve their kind here. Right. And uh, some people are kind of upset about that. Which which personally strikes me as being a very legitimate compromise. You must be in control. Yeah. yeah. I, there's a quote from uh, Ruth McCurry, chairs this uh, group supporting the ordina- ordination of women bishops, and uh, she accused the church of institutionalizing schism. She said, you'll have a group of people who don't recognize each other as bishops. Um, isn't that kind of already the case? I mean, now I understand this is England, whereas, you know, versus the Anglican Communion, all right? But when you consider the Anglican Communion is supposed to be all united, and you've got quite a few people that don't recognize Gene Robinson as a bishop, um, I, you know, you're already there. Get used to disappointment. And, uh, yeah. and you know, and either way, you're going to end up... Whichever way you decide on this, you're going to make people mad, you know? And so what they're trying to do here is find a compromise. Which, by the way, the, the Church of England is very good at. <laughs> that's, historically, that's well. what they have yeah. done. <laughs> that's, uh, um, they, they have historically done this very well. Um, and, you know, the BMAD is the middle way. And so um, how can you, in this case, uh, form a... Um, a compromise on this type of issue. Um, I mean, that's in, in many situations where women have become to be ordained, there's always been the understanding you do not have to have a woman pastor, you know, uh, or if you decide to have women, uh, or, or, or as a, a pastor, you don't, you don't have to accept women pastors in order to be ordained. Uh, now, generally, that's how it starts out. Now, for the Church of Sweden, where that promise was made, uh, that's no longer the case, mm-hmm. and several others were. Well, that was originally the promise. That was no longer the case. Uh, the fact of the matter is, if they begin to ordain women as bishops in the Church of England, initially they're going to say you are free to reject it. Yeah. But within less than a generation, you will no longer be free to reject it. Freedom is the right of all sentient beings. Yeah, that's uh, just the way it goes. Right. And, uh, yes, currently, you know, uh, um, this is the understanding of the current Archbishop of Canterbury, but what if you get a new Archbishop in there? Yeah, Rowan Williams, for, for an, uh, an Anglican, is pretty conservative. Um, and, uh, so, yeah, I mean, who do you get in next? And, you know, it's just, are they all, you know, we talked about in the ELCA, um, with ordaining, uh, active homosexuals. All right, what about, um, you know, they've got this conscience clause and, and stuff like that, but how long is that going to last? Um, it remains to be seen, but, uh, you know, it's it's really only a matter of time. Right. Um, you know, it, uh, uh, um, you know, the evangelicals in the Church of England, um, they think this is a good compromise. Um, they said um, they welcome this vote. Uh, is that it could it could avoid it would avoid a wholesale split. Said uh, if you forced these churches to accept women bishops and have the women walk in and do what they wanted to do as their bishop, uh, all the churches would, would would seek to leave the Church of England right. and become free and independent churches. Um, so um, <laughs> I like I like and, and speaking of what your your comment there earlier, Dale, uh, this uh, Paul Dawson from this Evangelical Group Reform says. Um, What's being suggested is no more of a split than what we have already. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, oh, yeah, the the Church of England, they're so united. That's why we keep talking about schism, because of all of the disagreements. I mean, it's it's really, I, I'm sorry, but, and and maybe uh, somebody from the, some anywhere in the Anglican Worldwide Communion can, uh, you know, fill us in on this. But, uh, you know what, it's kind of a sham. To say, oh, we're all united. No, what you've all done is agreed to disagree. All right, you're not united. You're, it's, it, it's fake. I'm sorry. Well, but... It's the via media. We have agreed to disagree. Here are the essentials. And uh, it's interesting. I mean, just a good example is the uh, um, uh, the 39 articles borrowed from the Augsburg Confession and definition of the church. 
don't know if you knew that. Uh, and they say that the church exists wherever the gospel is preached and the, the sacraments are administered. It is you who are mistaken. Yes. He knows what it, he knows what words are missing. Oh, and it's purity. Where the gospel is preached purely and, and the sacraments, sacraments are administered rightly. Or rightly according to the gospel. So uh, yeah, there, there, there's certain words there that are you know that, that are that are missing. Uh, why? Because they don't want to get into that issue. Yeah. So wow. <laughs> so that's uh, but that that was that's part of the genius of uh, Queen Elizabeth and Thomas Cramner was this this via media um, so that you could be Roman Catholic in your theology or you can be Reformed in your theology you can be Lutheran in your theology. And you fit in with the Church of England. They'll take you as soon as you're warm. So, it's, a, it's an interesting group. Hey, we got some feedback, Dale. Pick it up. Yeah, we did. All right. We got, uh, first of all, I want to mention uh, Torkelson100 on um, on YouTube. This is, I, I'm so excited about this because, okay, granted, he's about the only one ever. Okay. But it's intelligent feedback from YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, it says, uh, hi, Dale and Jim. Thanks for your contributions to current Christian issues from a Lutheran perspective. Thanks also for your balanced comments regarding my post on CrossFeed 120, Why Churches Are Shrinking. After thinking about my post, it could be best summarized in one short soundbite. To promote evangelism legalistically is an oxymoron. Thanks again, guys. So, um, yeah, <laughs> I like that. You know, that's and th that's something that's important. You know, I, we talk, I talk about evangelism a lot, all right? Um but it's always, you always have to go from the perspective of, look, God loves us. He loves us amazingly. Look how much he loves us. There are people out there that need to hear that haven't yet heard of God's amazing love. All right. We have the opportunity to go and share that love with them. What a tremendous blessing. What a tremendous honor. All right. You know, it's, it's all, it's because of the gospel. It's because of God's love. It's not, you're going to be a better Christian if you do this, or, or God's going to love you more, or, or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay. And then we also got a note, uh, from our friend, uh, Dave from Virginia, uh, speaking of ELCA people. And, uh, it's kind of long. Um, I don't know, but it's a really good letter. I don't know. Do we have Do we have time to to read the whole thing? Ah, uh, go ahead and read the whole thing. Make it quick. Okay. All right. Uh, greetings, brother pastors. I'm writing after hearing another fine set of episodes, 141, 142. I also really appreciate 137, the interview with Pastor Richard Johnson, as well as the other episodes where you've so graciously responded to the ELCA's August decisions regarding human sexuality. Thank you for your sympathetic treatment of this conflict. We're now facing in the ELCA and also for your prayers for us during this tumultuous point in our life. There's so much that I could say and would like to say about it, but there are two overriding and contradictory observations I'll make. The first is, these church-wide votes have managed to bring out the worst in many, many, many people on all sides of the debate. Among the countless ironies of this whole mess are the vast number of egregious public violations I have heard of the Eighth Commandment, all done supposedly in the name of the Sixth Commandment, the embarrassing appeal to and triumph of anecdotes over theology, and the desperate employment of law over gospel in a vain attempt to prove God's favor for one side or the other. I agree wholeheartedly. Um, the second is, as church conflicts go, I've seen worse. One of the burdens I bring to this whole conflict is an academic background in the history of early Christianity and its use of scripture, which not only means that I'm used to Taking a very long and patient view of things, the, icon the iconoclastic controversy lasted 117 years and the Donatist controversy over 200, but also that I know how rancorous and violent church fights can become. A fist fight broke out at the Council of Nicaea. There's something to think about next time you um, confess the Nicene Creed. Um, people were killed by their opponents in the iconoclastic controversy, and we would be remiss to omit the public acrimony in the Missouri Synod in the early 1970s surrounding the 1974 walkout. Good point. Um, nothing even close to that has so far happened here. When the ELCA assembly paused every 20 minutes for prayer, people side by side at opposing microphones held hands or draped their arms over each other while praying, a sign that they were unwilling to make this personal. So, and, you know, 
That's a really good point. And kudos for that. I kept seeing that as I was following the Twitter feed uh, from the convention. Um, yeah, there was there was definitely um, that was really cool. All right. Um, in Virginia, the division over this one issue of homosexuality is titled toward the traditional. We have at least two congregations that are reconciling in Christ congregations, but a much larger number where the leadership would hold to the more traditional positions. In the bishop's office, we have been accused, again by all sides, of failing to adopt and advocate our various critics' personal views. Of course, everyone thinks we should agree with them, and it's another sign of the heightened anxiety associated with the debate that we have become a lightning rod for multiple sources of anger and frustration. Welcome to the world of a bishop's office. <laughs> That's why I would never want to be there. Um, in response, we have tried in the short term to stick to the task of trying to walk with whoever needs accompaniment as we attempt to hold the church together as much as possible, and I think we have an excellent reason to be hopeful about that. Some who believe that ELCA actions represent an issue that is conspicuously church-dividing also believe that these actions are permanent and so they see no reason to stick around. You all made reference to one of our larger congregations that has already passed the first of their two required votes to withdraw from the LCA. But we are hoping not to lose anyone's voice in this ongoing debate because we don't know what will happen in the long term and need the traditional voices now more than ever. During this time, we con uh, concentrating on one primary thing, not taking our eyes off the ball, but focusing instead on our synodical division to be ambassadors for Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 16-21, and maintaining an ecclesiology that is informed more by Galatians 6, 1-5 and John 17 than by an overwrought and isolated application of 1 Corinthians 5, 9 and following and similar passages. In any case, we're certainly seeing one angle, although not the usual or laudable one of what it means to be the church militant. Thanks again for this podcast ministry. God bless you both. I pray that you may one day, that, uh, that we may one day meet face to face without having to wait for the eschaton. So, yeah. Um, great article. I really, really appreciate the insight, Dave. Excellent thank, you, thank you so much. And and just, you know, that's that insight. I've, I I keep saying this over and over, all right, That and this is something, I, I will confess that this is something that we in the Missouri Synod are not good at, okay, and that is speaking the truth in love, all right? We tend to get so hung up on the truth that we forget to present it in a loving way, all right? And that is something that I have seen the ELCA actually do fairly well. I mean, there's sort of, it's it's kind of one way or the other. I mean, I've, I've definitely seen a lot of sort of name-calling and things going back and forth. But, um, but, you know, that's true. We, you know, we get this attitude of, I'm right, you're wrong, and I don't want to hear it. I don't want to discuss it. Um, just let me know when you repent, and I'm out of here. And, or you're out of here, you know. Um, I'm taking my marbles and going home. All right. But the only way that we grow as a church is by discussing these issues, by talking about them, by hearing each other out, even if you don't agree with a person, because it's through that that we learn where the person is coming from. And maybe that means so that by, by hearing where they're coming from, you can see the root of the error. Or, um, you know, it may be that by hearing where they're coming from that you say, Okay, you know what? I I'm not coming from the same angle. Um, not necessarily going to agree with you, but at least I know how to pray for you, you know, or or whatever. And so it's just and that's but that's also how we show love for each other by respecting each other. Um, we talked about this on the last episode a bit about um, when when Jim was gone about uh, respecting people that you disagree with. And uh, so yeah, I mean. Let's we as a, now, wait as a, a minute. church. We pray for each other. We pray that God will show you how wrong you are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know I spend so that he, you will no longer be condemned to hell because you're <laughs> so wrong. I spend a lot of time talking to atheists and agnostics and um, people of all different uh, backgrounds besides being Christian. And, um, and you know, I, I just get tremendous insight from them. I, I grow in my faith from talking to them because they challenge me, um, you know, and they make me really think about what I believe and why I believe it. And, um, and you know, and, and I've said this many times, but those who disagree with you are not the enemy. The devil is the enemy, and we need to gang up on him, you know, 
Now, that's not to say that the uh, differences in doctrine aren't important. They absolutely are, unquestionably. Right? And we need to be discussing these things. We can't just push them under the rug because then we're not doing anybody any good. Right? But at the same time, we, um, you know, we've got to, we've got to hold to the truth and we need to do it in love. This is true love. That's true. Anyway, folks, uh, if you have any comments, always welcome at podcast at crossfeednews.com or you can follow our, give us some good intelligent feedback on YouTube is always welcome. Otherwise, God bless you. Watch over and give you a good week. Yep. Good night, everybody. God bless. You.